industry analysis. Industry analysis is part of a top-down analysis with the eventual outcome of trying to find the best companies to invest in the best industries subject to the macroeconomic conditions that are prevalent at the time. In today's session, we'll start off by looking at how <clears throat> we identify categories in which to classify our industries. We'll take a look at some of the standard methods and talk a little bit about some of the issues with that. We'll also take a look at the business life cycle, the industry life cycle, and the economic life cycle, and some of the qualitative factors that will affect industries that are operating within these cycles. We'll learn how to evaluate future industry prospects by analyzing the business cycle. In our earlier sessions, we discussed the way that a top-down fundamental analysis works. It starts off by looking at the economy to understand fully the macroeconomic conditions in which industries and companies will operate. We learned how to identify economic indicators, changes in GDP, the, essentially the growth in the economy, but other things like uh, employment, unemployment, the uh, uh, public sector borrowing, which may also constrain investment, and so on. We also, we also talked a little bit about some of the stages in a business cycle and the way that market sentiment is identified. In today's session, we're going to take a look at industry structure <clears throat> and how companies are classified within industries. Uh, the nature of competitive advantage is discussed by academics like Michael Porter and the concept of an economic moat. Uh, once we've done this, the next step, of course, is to take a look at companies within the industry, learn how to pick winners and identify losers. Industry analysis, therefore, is the second step of a fundamental analysis for common equity investment. We look for the industries that show the most promise, the greatest potential for growth, and having identified those, we'll, we'll try to find companies within those industries. The concepts that we use for analyzing and understanding valuation are exactly the same that we discuss in corporate finance. Now, ultimately, value is created by the ability to generate free cash flows, and they're offset by the amount of risk that we have to take in order to achieve those. And of course, timing is the third factor. So early achievement of high free cash flows with low risk creates the greatest value. And that's what we're looking at as well when we look at industries. <clears throat> the uh, analysis of industries is a bit different from looking at companies because it's also going to be subject to other things like new businesses entering into the industry, other businesses exiting from the industry through bankruptcy perhaps or mergers and acquisition. So their industry subset will change as well. The, uh, the value of an industry is seen by assessing the performance and comparing it to other industries over time. We have uh, reporting of industries through things like the stock indexes. In the Canadian case, we have the Standard & Poor's TSX Composite Index that includes all of the industries. And within that, we have subsectors that tell us about the performance of particular companies, particular industries. Stock performance is largely affected by the macroeconomic conditions and the industry. In fact, about 80% of value change in stocks can be attributed to things that are happening in the underlying economy and things that are happening in the industry. Now, obviously, this means that we should avoid industries that are in decline, or at least if we're going to invest in those industries, we have to be very strategic about it. Some of the things that will also be important to us is that we need to understand the industry performance in terms of its consistency. Looking for and maintaining positions in growing industries tends to lead to greater return. And <clears throat> it also leads us with problems of whether or not the past is a reliable predictor of the future. Clearly at a time like this, in the middle of a pandemic, we know that there can be substantial structural changes in the way that economies work. After the pandemic, certain types of industries like retail might never be the same again. We'll see the, the rise of alternative delivery models. In particular, online shopping is a great example of how things may be very different, structurally different than they were in the past. People who are value investors consistently remind us that we shouldn't forget about some of those old and boring industries. Investors like Warren Buffett have done a brilliant job of 
recognizing value and creating value by investing in very uh, tired and boring industries. You know, who would have thought there'd be that much money in railroads and insurance? But by investing strategically in industries that are largely in decline, there, there's certainly money to be made. We see that certain companies, certain types of specialists follow industries and this helps us to understand some of those structural changes that would happen within industries. Uh, a great example is a company called Gartner Research who follows the computer business. If you're listening to this on a computer, you could be using one of several different form factors. A desktop computer, they still exist. Laptops, convertible laptops, um, <clears throat> ultra mobile computing, including things like those convertible laptops, but also things like tablets, even cell phones, smartphones that are able to uh, to, to provide this kind of uh, this kind of uh, media. In fact, I don't know. Maybe somebody's even watching this on their wristwatch. The changes in the industry then are, are charted by companies like Gartner. You can see from this table in some research they published a few years ago, they were talking about some of the structural changes that was happening that were happening in the industry. And if you knew the industry quite well, you knew which players were leading this change and which ones were chasing. For example, if you look back to perhaps 2014, you could see that traditional computing was the most, well, was the dominant uh, part of the industry. If you're a company like IBM or rather Lenovo or, or, or Dell and you were thinking about the future, the future to you quite possibly was in desktop computing, creating more power in a box that would sit on somebody's desk. Uh, people were also, of course, using laptops, uh, notebook computers and also even in 2014 there was some use of tablets but the predominant part of the industry was in those traditional type of computers. We could see that also there was uh, some market for things like uh, <coughs> uh, smart uh, mobile phones so people would still be using their phones for some uh, advanced services but not for quite as much. Um, predicted by 2013, uh, 2017 you can see there's a shift away from the traditional PCs and more towards mobile computing. And of course, that's exactly what we have seen. We know when we come into a classroom, people are as likely to have a tablet or a phone in front of them as they are to have a laptop. And when you ask people about their desktop computers, they look at you with a glazed stare. What do you mean by that? Even understanding what an industry is may be a bit of a challenge. And we have seen that Industrial classifications are very specific. They tell us that if you produce this kind of product, you must be in that industry. If you loan money, you must be a bank. If you uh, provide transportation services, you're an airline or a railway and so on. We had a great example of how this logic fails from the early 20th century. It was something that we recognized later as railroad syndrome. And that was because people that were in that industry tended to talk only about their industry. If you wanted to talk about transporting goods across the United States or across Canada, you were talking about a railway. And that's because there were no uh, interstate highways, there was no Trans-Canada Highway. If you wanted to ship goods from A to B, you took your goods to a rail depot, you put it onto a train, the train went across the country, you picked up the goods at the rail depot with your truck and you delivered it to the end user that made sense and still it's a very efficient mode of travel but by the time we got into the post-war era and Eisenhower started with the construction of the interstate highway system as part of their defense infrastructure we now had an alternative unfortunately investors in railways failed to recognize that and when they looked at investing they said well investing in transportation is about choosing between these five railroads and this one is the best of the five and of course there was always an argument about who the best railway was and they argued until the industry pretty much fell apart. Nobody who is a railway investor recognized that there was a persistent move from the rail system to the rubber, tri rubber tired business of trucking and so by the 1970s and 1980s the railway system essentially collapsed. Investors lost a lot of money because nobody saw trucking coming. 
That was what we described as the railway syndrome. I spent a lot of time talking to bankers about this because they also have a type of railway syndrome, a railroad syndrome. They say, well, you know, we have to watch the other banks and see what they're doing. For one bank in particular, they had a whole section in their strategic uh, <clears throat> management section, uh, their their uh, information section, where they were were gathering intelligence about other banks and who's looking at the non-bank providers of financial services. Now, right now, if I have a credit card, it might equally be issued by a bank as a supermarket or even Canadian Tire. And there are alternative services that have arisen like PayPal that uh, are both a complement to their products but also a threat. In the lending business, we have alternative forms of lending. And of course, we have a whole new term called fintech that describes applications that will provide a lot of those financial services. So that would be another interesting example of railroad syndrome. So industries should not be considered to be about the incumbents, but about the service and the clients who receive the product. So when we think about banking, we should be thinking about banking consumers rather than the incumbent providers, the, the five banks in Canada that tend to dominate most of our business. The uh, <clears throat> classification of industries is usually done within a framework that is uh, provided by a number of classification systems. In equity markets, the Standard & Poor's TSX index is broken down into categories or industry groups and subgroups, which then contain all of the players in the, uh, in the uh, TSX index. So about 380 companies are broken down into those 40 different subgroups and 14 categories. Clearly, some diversified companies don't fit very well but somebody has to provide that classification. We have much more granular types of classification systems. Probably the best known is the US uh, <clears throat> Library of Congress's standard industrial classification. Uh, that essentially provides either a four or a six digit number, which is used to describe all of the companies that operate in the United States or actually around the world. All companies have at least one SIC code and some have four or five, depending on the different lines of business in which they mostly operate. The uh, Canadian uh, system, NAICS, is the new worldwide standard. We've largely taken over from SIC because SIC was very, very slow to identify new industries. Uh, industries arise, uh, things like autonomous vehicles would perhaps take five years or ten years before they could get into the SIC book. NAICS has a, a, a more, <coughs> actually a more granular system. It has more categories and it t tends to work better. So organizations like the OECD have adopted early those other alternative systems. Still, we know that it's very hard to classify some, uh, some companies because they operate in so many businesses or perhaps because what they produce is so different from anyone else that the classification largely looks like nonsense. When we're analyzing companies, we may also understand those companies through their position in a business product life cycle. That life cycle is usually based on uh, an embryonic or pioneering stage as the earliest stage where the product is brand new. The type of customers who are going to use the product are unclear, uncertain. Um, there may be many players, but we really don't know because the business and the product is so new. Um, we see an early uh, increase in demand as uh, those early adopters buy the product as we start to manufacture from our own very small factories. <clears throat> uh, but since the business is so new and so interesting, it tends to attract a lot of private money. In particular, venture capitalists, seed capital financiers are likely to, to provide money to those kind of businesses. And new companies will enter into the market because they see that as uh, an opportunity. At this stage, it's very hard to see if one particular standard or one particular product will be a dominant one, but we'll know about that later as we move through the cycle. In the second stage, we see that the industry is taking off, and we start to have some companies that we recognize, some products that become essentially the dominant players. There are still new entrants, 
perhaps the standard may change, but during the expansion stage, we start to see some recognizable products. And probably more importantly, our consumers start to understand why they're buying the product. They find real uses for it and they identify particular features that are going to be especially important to them. Uh, you know, is the product light, lightweight? Maybe that was not a really important factor and two or three companies spent a lot of time trying to pr produce the lightest product when other providers uh, focused on durability. Company operations become more stable. <clears throat> they become more professional. They have to have more employees and we now we need a marketing manager and a finance manager um, as well as the operations manager who originally was the, the, the key employee key employee or the key uh, uh, member of management. New funds continue to be attracted to the industry because we have to build up scale. We have to scale up that small prototype factory and turn it into a mass producer. And so this requires a lot of money, mostly venture capital still, but we get a lot of money in from the banks because the banks recognize there's a bankable proposition. Companies start to produce regular accounts. We have financial policies were established. I don't know about dividends being payable. This might come much later, but several of our textbooks would describe that. And this becomes much more attractive to investors. We're probably still not a public company yet, but we have more investors. A company like Facebook is a great example because it had about a thousand major investors, including people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett even, who put a little bit of money into Facebook before it was a public company. <clears throat> In the next stage, we start to move into uh, more of a maturity stage. The nature of the business changes. It goes from being a, a startup with a, a with really high rate of growth to a more moderate rate of growth. The growth is still positive, but perhaps the company and the industry starts to grow at a declining rate. The growth is still upwards, but the first derivative or the uh, the, the the convexity of that line changes. So it's concave relative to the, the y-axis. The uh, marketplace <clears throat> may look like it's got too many competitors. Competition may still be fragmented, but this is where things start to change. And because we've reached a mass production stage, costs are going to become more stable. We also have more providers of services. We have uh, outsourcing available and supply chains become a little bit more regular. Certain things like standards might help us to simplify those things. And then probably we move on to a next stage, which isn't on our list, which is essentially a decline in the industry, where the industry is forced to reinvent itself, perhaps moving into negative growth, into a real decline. There certainly are some limitations with this approach. It works very well when we're describing a, a simple phenomena like the growth of a human from a, a baby to a to a youth to a teenager to a young adult to an adult and uh, to a senior citizen. <clears throat> it doesn't work so well when we're describing industries because quite often industries become more fragmented. We also see industries reinventing themselves. For example, if you're in computing, computing used to mean one thing. It used to mean a desktop computer that sat on your desk and then we had a, a small spin-off in the laptop business, relatively t small in terms of volume, eventually we move into lightweight laptop computers and notebook computers, and essentially a whole new cycle starts again, overlapping the original cycle. So it's kind of like you have a curve on a curve on a curve starting a few years after each other. A and then eventually some of the players decide that the future of computing is not in hardware, but in software and infrastructure. Companies like Dell, who might completely reinvent themselves as cloud computing companies. So the original approach was to look at sales, uh, but essentially the market might be much more complicated and interesting than that. And here's an example, <clears throat> and well, several examples that are based on an industry life cycle. And we've talked about the pioneering or embryonic stage, the growth stage, maturity stage. There might be something in between maturity and growth, which uh, our, our Macmillan Pinto textbook, Chapter 9, describes as a shakeout stage. The growth is still positive, but we're growing at a smaller rate. This essentially is an inflection point between this mass growth and shakeout level of growth, because at this point, 
the decrease in growth means that not everybody can grow. Not everybody can be as successful as they were a year or two years earlier. And so investors will decide to move from one company to another, leading to possibility for mergers, acquisition, perhaps some failures, but essentially consolidation of the industry. As we get into the mature phase, we now have uh, a, a product which may be moving towards commodity. We have standardization of production, more offshore production, and, and some of the other things we've talked about earlier. And of course, then we have a decline stage. If you look at several examples of products, you can think of, or you can, you can ask, where do these type of products, where do these industries fit in? We have um, several new and emerging industries which are clearly in the embryonic stage. Uh, and uh, you know Google's new autonomous vehicle or other types of autonomous vehicles, flying cars, uh, uh, Uber type of, uh, uh, of, of services that involve autonomous vehicles. These things represent not just one, but perhaps many new industries. Because we have, in the case of autonomous vehicles, not just the manufacturing of the hardware, but we have several different types of software products, including things like the geolocation software that tells the car where it, where it is, the sensors that are going to, be, going to be needed to tell the vehicle where it is within lanes. We've got uh, the overall intelligence in the vehicle that takes the information from the sensors and, and speaks to the... Uh, geolocation products and all together puts the vehicle into uh, the right place at the right time. There may even be a network uh, system that is required in order to tell vehicles where they are relative to other vehicles and relative to the clients and perhaps their destinations. So something like this, you know, we can talk about it as part of a simple embryonic stage in the life cycle, but it could be much more complicated and interesting than that. Uh, of course, a more developed product like Tesla has moved from the embryonic stage into the mass market because we have now got uh, a need for mass production. And perhaps I shouldn't be using Tesla this week because all kinds of weird things are happening to its mass production, including facilities in China. Uh, there is the, the need to deal with the, the battery technologies, which may be changing over time. And then on top of that, we have the autonomous vehicle layer. So Tesla is probably mostly in the growth stage. We haven't yet got competition that threatens the shakeout, at least not quite yet, but that's going to be happening soon. And some of the technologies are still in the embryonic stage. What about a company like Best Buy? Now, clearly it's brick and mortar retail business, but it has been trying to transition to not only an online business, but a marketplace business dealing with uh, networks and trying to create something that's similar to what both Amazon and eBay have managed in the past. So part of Best Buy is clearly in the decline stage where they're winding down their retail business, but at the same time, they're finding new uses for the retail properties and those expensive leases that they're locked into by finding a, 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 a way to apply an Amazon model to their existing business. And perhaps Canada Post is another interesting example. You know, there's not, there aren't very many businesses that are older than a post office. However, Canada Post has had to reinvent itself because it is a main supplier to businesses like Amazon who uh, require still require Canada Post in order to deliver goods that last mile. I know I, I have a very traditional mail delivery system where I live. I have a, a post office box. I have Bill who drives the truck and brings the goods to the post office box. And now when I see him, his little truck is just stuffed to the rafters with Amazon boxes. So Canada Post has to deliver on my little island. And it's the only provider of courier services. And so they are actually finding themselves not in the maturity or decline stage, but in some of their businesses, they have to reinvent themselves. And so they're, they're still in a growth phase, but certainly not for the traditional mail and the advertising businesses. How about your MBA degree? You know, that is a business and a business model, which was developed over a hundred years ago and was started off in uh, with the idea that there are probably a few hundred people in the United States that could use an MBA. 
by the time we got into the 1980s, there were perhaps 50 or 60,000 people doing MBA programs. And worldwide now, they're probably in the millions of people that are doing some kind of an advanced business degree. Well, even the MBA program has changed. It's gone from being two years of sitting in a classroom to much more complicated delivery models and more variations for different special needs. So while it is in a mature stage, and possibly, I hope not for your sake, but I, I hope, and for my sake as well, but I hope it's not in a decline, but it's in, also in a stage where it has to redesign itself, redevelop itself. It's probably also still in a growth phase. So the model itself, the idea of an industry life cycle, not quite as simple as it used to be. The implications for stock prices of these kind of issues are essentially that we have to reevaluate the risk and returns. Cash flow in a business cycle tends to be greatest as we get into the late stage of the growth cycle. We require less investment in capital, uh, capital machinery and plant. We have the, the highest number of uh, customers, the greatest number of customers, still paying a high margin. As we get into the late stage of the growth cycle, margins decrease and, and we uh, uh, start to produce more of a commodity product. There's less differentiation of our product. But the risk at the same time tends to fall. So early stages, high risk, weak cash flow. Later stages, we have uh, kind of a mix. When we get into the decline stage, cash flow tends to become largely positive, but risk is non-existent. We know exactly where we're heading. So understanding the cash flows is a big part of understanding that process. You can see by looking at the, essentially, the economic value added in different industries, how this may be relevant. Some of those mature industries tend to be at the top of our EVA creation. In this chart, the highest, uh, the highest positive numbers represent the return on invested capital minus the weighted average cost of capital, or a number we talked about last semester as EVA spread. The greatest EVA spread goes to things like construction materials, data networking, money management, uh, and so on. Some of the largest negative EVA is going to be in some of the highest technology businesses like biotechnology because we know that they tend to be developing products rather than selling them. They're at the embryonic stage. So <clears throat> this is an interesting example of how those cash flows and how the risk and return might equate to industries in different parts of the cycle. We also need to be able to understand some of the qualitative aspects of industries. Historical performance tells us a lot about the business. The company's record of sales and earnings, of growth, price performance are going to be part of our analysis. But as there are structural changes within the economy and within industries, the past might not be representative of the future. Competitive conditions in an industry may also change as well. An industry which has been very well organized consolidated four or five main, main players might be completely changed by the entrant of a, entrance of a new player. Uh, retail has certainly been changed by companies like Amazon. Media has been changed by companies like Google and Facebook, the stories that we're hearing about today. We may also be in an industry where a very fragmented industry is moving into more consolidation, perhaps like the grocery business has been uh, recently with fewer players providing a larger percentage of our, our food, including consolidation up and down the value chain by, by uh, having uh, large supermarkets taking over things like production of milk and eggs. To understand an industry, we need particularly well-defined sources. Most industries have got a standard uh, analysis framework. For example, if you're in mining, there's a pretty good chance that if you go into just about any mining organization, in the old days you would have found a copy of the Northern Miner in the uh, reception area and probably on the desk of several of the people in the office because everybody needed to know about what the competition was doing. They needed to know about the price for commodities that they were looking for. They needed to know uh, if there were any changes in the industry and they needed to know it daily. And that's why we had publications like the Northern Miner. Or in the forest industry, 
There was Madison's Lumber Reporter, which eventually turned into just Madison's website, which would tell us things like, what's the uh, what's the price of a two by four, or a thousand board feet of two by four, or who's building a new plant to uh, to produce a fiber board in northern BC, and that information would be shared throughout the entire industry, originally in paper form, and now of course it's online. And we saw that Gartner is a good example of a consultancy business, which developed into an information business that tells people about trends in computing. And of course, there's the general media. If you're uh, looking at a particular industry, and one that I tend to follow is uh, the, the, uh, the lumber business or the forest product business, you can see that there are certain things that will affect the industry and will affect everybody in the industry to a certain degree. Things like trade um, uh, trade wars, if you sell your lumber to the United States, if Home Depot is your biggest customer in the United States, clearly trade wars could be important. Uh, a lot of uh, the allowable uh, production in forestry, the allowable annual cut, would disappear with a single forest fire, or could disappear with a single forest fire, or a particularly bad season. And of course we have things like the pine beetle epidemic, or the spruce budworm epidemic, which may also have effects on the long-term uh, cash flows to your business. So those are some of the sources that I, I'd like to highlight, and every industry has got different sources of information. Now, one common theme that we find in understanding industries is the changes in the supply chain or the value chain that uh, <clears throat> are going to perhaps be changing as as uh, companies uh, buy up their suppliers or start to integrate forward and buy up their customers. And Michael Porter did some of his early PhD research looking at an area of economics called industrial organization. And in that, he basically said, well, you know, take a look at some of these industries, stable, historical, uh, historically important industries like brewing or uh, groceries, and we can see that there has been consolidation in some of these things. And what's the reason for this happening now? Why is it now possible for a company to integrate backwards or forwards? And usually it was a decrease in the barriers to those things. What, what are the barriers to company integrating forward or backwards? And going beyond this later on, in a couple of books he wrote during the 1980s, he said, well, not only do we see the value chain and the changes in the value chain being influenced by these falling or raised barriers to integration, but we see the new entrants who are attracted to a particularly profitable business, and we also see substitute products that are, are available which don't really require that a company enter into direct competition to steal the clients from those companies. So those became four of the five forces. Uh, the fifth force, of course, is the rivalry between the existing competitors in, the, in that industry. Most um, of our textbooks try to go a little bit further because they recognize that the industry is not just affected by the industry itself. Those are called the endogenous or inside factors, but they're also exogenous factors or factors from outside the industry which are going to be possibly even more important. And they're going to influence the way that competition happens within those industries. Those exogenous factors include things like the demographic influences, the age of the population, perhaps uh, some of the socio-cultural factors, uh, a rise uh, in uh, observant uh, Islam, for example, may have an important implication for uh, businesses like banking or uh, selling alcohol. Um, younger population, a change in the population may affect the way that people use cars or use media. Uh, who watches TV anymore? Who's who using who's using broadcast? A television. Uh, it certainly is not uh, not millennials. Or where do we find people to work in our business? If you're a company like McDonald's and you depend on a high turnover of uh, of young workers to stand behind the counter, uh, technology is one of those other factors. And perhaps at McDonald's, their answer to a demographic challenge is a technological challenge. Uh, they've 
shifted to using more online ordering and uh, electronic kiosks in their business. Some of the other factors, um, social influences, changes in what's socially acceptable, uh, and certainly we can put some of the pandemic conditions in there today. Uh, we have government influences. Governments may decide that certain businesses are no longer as desir desirable or perhaps more desirable. And the th things like stage in the business cycle, uh, our long-term growth prospects, structural changes in the economy may also be part of our business. Your company like banks, there aren't very many things that are more important than interest rates and government regulation. And here's an example of how those barriers to entry may help to create stable market share. If you're in a regulated market and producing things like orthopedic devices would certainly be regulated by, in the United States, the FDA, Health Canada, in Canada, but uh, you would uh, have to, uh, in, you'd have to get government approval and you'd have to go through an academic uh, process in order to have your, your products produced. It tends to keep the number of players limited. In this particular example from the Macmillan P Pinto book, you can see that there are only five major suppliers who have worldwide market share uh, 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 that actually control 95% of the market for this product. And one of the things that we see here is that from the beginning to the end of this time series, there's there are only small changes in market share. Smith and Nephew look like they've created a, 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 a slight increase from being the smallest player in the industry to being, being the second smallest player in the industry, and doing that at the cost of a couple of the bigger players. But largely, the industry is unchanged. So if one of these players develops a, a new technology, a new uh, product which is different from the others. They may eventually take market share from the others, but it will take time. Some of these things like uh, growth, uh, competition, may be part of our overall view of how money is made in an industry. And you can see that if we look at <clears throat> in finance, certain companies are trying to differentiate themselves by saying that there are more ways to make money. Uh, I, I won't play this because of copyright restrictions, but uh, one one commercial that uh, we often see on the uh, on TV, if you still watch broadcast TV, is something from Fidelity touting how they produce uh, a different kind of financial analysis, something called factor-based analysis, or sorry, factor-based investing. We talk about it sometimes as smart beta which uh, essentially says that we can look at more than just the simple idiosyncratic risk that's, that's caused by uh, a firm's individual uh, business decisions, but certain other beta factors could affect uh, the overall performance of a company like growth, momentum, small cap versus large cap, value versus growth, and so on. So we might end up with four or five different beta factors. Of course, it's the, the purpose of the company to try to differentiate themselves from the rest of their industry. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, just about most finance firms, just about all finance firms, uh, will tell you that they do have a type of factor-based trading program. Mm. That doesn't mean an awful lot for us because academics have pretty much generated that with the exception of momentum, there really is no consensus that any of these other factors are significant and persistently important. So differentiation might also be a big part of that process. Something else that's important is that quite often in industries, they remain stable because any change in an industry requires an awful lot of capital investment. A super example of that is that big pulp mill just south of town. Now, Harmac has been there for uh, certainly as long as I've been coming to Nanaimo, 40 or 50 years at least. It is now a, a private company that is owned by its employees. But as a pulp mill, it's a great example of a company that deals with a very high investment in capital, high fixed asset to sales ratio. Its ability to increase capacity is limited, not just by the amount of capital investment required, but the supply of its raw material, the, the wood chips that comes from the sawmills up and down the coast. Uh, 
if things are going really well, they would be in a position to get higher prices for their pulp, but they can't increase their production to take advantage of that. And if things are going badly, they have little incentive to stop production because most of their costs are fixed. The other sawmills are still producing wood chips. So maybe they'll use a little bit less natural gas to produce their, their pulp and a little bit more wood chip or hog fuel to produce their chips. But essentially, there's no change in their business if the industry slows down. So they end up producing to inventory when things are going slowly. Shutting down or, or uh, restarting the mill might take months, so they tend not to uh, stop business unless things are going badly. And things are actually going quite well now because this is one of the principal producers of exactly the right kind of pulp to make things like face masks and surgical gowns. So th they're actually one of our more successful businesses at the moment. There are many qualitative aspects that may also be important. Uh, government regulation, government interference in your business might be a very important part of what you do. For example, in banks, one of the most important factors comes from the combined effect of having to deal with the central bank who determines the supply of money that you have to lend, and also the federal regulators at the Department of Finance who make rules about uh, how you operate and how you report your operations. Small changes in either of those two bodies could have huge effects on the bottom line of the financial institution. So that tends to make those businesses not only stable, but almost impervious to new competitors. Nobody can join the banking business unless those two regulators have had their say. There may also be changes in the way that the economy works. Um, my slide reminds me that we've moved from an industrial to an information society. Of course, that's true. But even more relevant today, we can see industries like retail that have changed from that bricks and mortar model, and they've been slowly evolving into more of an online model. And at the current moment, of course, we see that people are not just buying things online, but they're buying things from brick and mortar locations using uh, the uh, uh, using the internet. If I want to buy something at Walmart, I can order it online and pick it up at the store. Uh, I can go in the store, although it's a little bit of a hassle. More and more people are choosing the first option. If we're looking for potential investments, we're thinking about what's going to happen to industries in the future. And forecasting is always part of the value identification process. So we need to look for the industries that are going to be the best candidates for growth and prosperity in the future and looking for industries that are going to be on the other side of that equation. Um, <clears throat> some industries are likely to have difficulty as we shift from an industrial to an information-based economy, and being able to spot those creates opportunities for maybe not investment, but for divestment, especially if those challenges are going to be sudden and unexpected. Picking industries that are going to be successful in the next year, the next two years, for the next decade, it means identifying industries likely to sh show improved cash flow, improve earnings. To do that, we have to take a look at the industry uh, and the earnings that are going to be available, although those predictions of growth tend to be difficult uh, to, to prove. Which uh, industries are overpriced? Um, if industries are recognized as being high value, then they probably have low price earnings multiples. If we could, could to take advantage of that value, like investors like Warren Buffett or Jimmy Pattison more locally have done, we identify companies that are, are a bargain. For example, Jimmy Pattison has made a career and made himself possibly Canada's richest man, at least in the top group, by identifying industries that are underpriced. The forest industry, for example, parts of the advertising industry, the car business, and, and certain food businesses. We tend to pay too much for industries that are favored, for industries in which people are excited about. Amazon has got great prospects, but it's also very expensive as a stock, perhaps a little bit too expensive. The uh, direction of interest rates might be, uh, might be a factor. Some industries are affected much more by interest rate changes. At the moment, the prospect for interest rates is that they will fall. And that suggests that certain industries will, will continue to grow 
uh, although they're affected by other things. Um, things that uh, we tend to finance tend to be affected by interest rates. If you're a company that produces industrial machinery and interest rates are low, companies are more likely to finance the purchase of equipment like bulldozers or forklifts. And if you're in an industry where those uh, interest rates are rising, you're much more likely to put off the purchase of those discretionary investments. Um, other industries are more likely affected by political events. The oil industry possibly is a, is a great, great example of that. Um, perhaps defense spending might also be involved. Um, changes in technology. I, I hear people say about the aircraft manufacturers that countries will not need uh, airplanes in the future because drones will largely replace some of that technology. So things like that may also be part of our analysis. For the, the business cycle, <clears throat> we want to be able to understand the way that an industry operates within business cycles as compared to the industry cycle. How is an industry's uh, ability to operate going to be reflected in the economy as a whole? Some industries tend to move with the business cycle. Some industries tend to move contrary to that business cycle. Uh, growth industries are industries that tend to do well within, uh, within a, a, a growing economy. We uh, <clears throat> see the uh, um, uh, growth industries um, Companies like uh, Google, Amazon, for, for example, will continue to do well despite uh, recession because while they might have grown at a rate 10 times as fast or 15 times as fast during a, a, a positive part of stage in the economy, during a downward stage in the economy, they may only grow twice as fast as the average company. So still a positive uh, outlook, even though the economy might be trending downwards. Defensive industries are those products, those companies, and those industries that produce goods that people need to buy regardless of what's happening around us. Uh, if you produce something like soap or toothpaste or shampoo, perhaps toilet paper, people are still going to use your product even if things are not going well. We describe companies like Unilever and Procter & Gamble Colgate, those uh, consumer cyclical uh, products, as, uh, <clears throat> as being uh, a defensive business. Cyclical industries are the ones that tend to trend with the industry. Uh, so if the economy is doing well, they do well, and if the economy is doing badly, they do worse. We can also say that some industries tend to move opposite to the business cycle. For example, um, uh, lending organizations like Money Mart and uh, uh, debt rating agencies are, are likely to do very well. Some people would say, take a look at Walmart, maybe Canadian Tire. They would tend to do better in a recession than some of their competitors because they provide goods which may actually replace more expensive alternatives. So instead of uh, buying a new car, you're not doing very well. And perhaps you can buy new, new parts for your car. You can buy yourself some new seat covers because you can't afford to buy the new car to replace that car. Some uh, industries, as I've mentioned before, are going to be sensitive to interest rate changes. We're also going to uh, <clears throat> try to identify some of those companies and say this would be the time to sell because we expect that interest rates are going to, uh, going to rise as the economy is doing better. The central bank re restricts the amount of credit that's available. Those companies might suffer. On average, banks tend to be interest rate sensitive. Even insurance companies, which are largely made up of investment portfolios, tend to be interest rate sensitive. But some of those can, some of those um, industrial product companies may, or, or real estate businesses might also be interest sensitive. Our better understanding of the business cycle will help us to decide what kind of things to buy in which stage of the cycle. And uh, it helps us to avoid certain industries. Now, the process of aligning our portfolio to a business cycle is called sector rotation. In a sector rotation model, we uh, essentially buy things that are consumer cyclical industries, durables like washing machines and furniture, uh, non-durables, uh, things that we'll, we'll use and throw away. Those kind of products are, are, are things that are going to generally move with the economy They'll trend, we say. So if the economy is going up, 
if uh, if GNP and GDP growth is positive, then we tend to buy more of these things. In the late parts or the uh, <clears throat> uh, the at the end of the of the cycle, they tend to trend downwards. Defensive products, things like the toilet paper or perhaps uh, electricity, is another interesting defensive product. Things like that to tend to maintain their profitability during recessions. We still need to use electricity to watch TV, although we're perhaps not using it to as much at work. We still flush our toilets, so we still need uh, uh, oh, uh, investment in the water company, perhaps. Uh, still need toothpaste, still need shampoo. Maybe we, do, maybe we don't use the, the more expensive variety, but we still need to buy it when the economy is not doing well. A uh, successful sector rotation strategy essentially means we need to understand how the industry fits into the economy and probably even more importantly be able to understand which stage in that economy we're at. Uh, are we in a recession now? Technically not because a recession requires two quarters of negative, uh, negative uh, uh, GDP. However, there aren't very many people I know who would forecast that things are going to become positive within the next three months. So we say that different sectors will do it do well at different stages in the business cycle. And of course, we describe the business cycle as recovery, the, the very bottom of a cycle after a recession, early upswing, where there's a lot of uncertainty whether or not we are actually in the upswing, late upswing, where we start to accept that the, the economy has moved from bear to bull, and then late bull, where probably we're at right now, where the economy starts to slow. And finally, when we turn that corner, we're officially in recession because we've had two quarters of negative GDP growth. We need to keep an open mind about how we interpret this conventional wisdom. Of course, we have had a hundred years of learning how to operate with the type of industries which we now work in. But industries changed. We've been through the first industrial revolution, perhaps, or an agricultural revolution. We've been through the, 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 the second phase of that agricultural revolution, where we started to build uh, steel mills and, uh, and, and create uh, you know, the electrical products that we needed. We've been through um, an information uh, revolution and a service revolution. And Perhaps we're into our fourth industrial revolution. In 2011, the German government <coughs> uh, tried to define how this new revolution would work. And this is probably where we are right now. They described it as Industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution. And they said the type of industries that we recognize now may be in themselves, and our classification for them, obsolete. The way that we make things is no longer just an approach of looking at a, a value chain that's made up of producers who sell to producers, who sell to producers, who sell to retailers, who sell to consumers. It's not just a value chain with the steps in between defined by barriers to entry, as Michael Porter talked about. We now have ecosystems that are used to produce things. Some producers may be consumers in their own right. We might have products which are very complicated, which are made up of many components. And perhaps uh, the ultimate producer of those products will produce maybe only one or two percent of the content. And the content may be supplied by today's producer of that product or a different producer tomorrow. We see that in the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things at the consumer end, we recognize by things like your smart thermometer or I've got a fountain that somehow goes on and off every time I talk to Google. So that's the, the Internet of Things that we have for consumers, but there's also an Internet of Things for industry. And, and that may be represented by some of those new products that are being developed and we're still learning how to use like autonomous uh, transportation. So under this, this, this heading, I would say, watch this space. We really don't know how to analyze these industries yet. And it's something that we're going to be learning about and learning how to invest in for years to come. That's all for today's session. Um, I hope you uh, learned something about 
analyzing industries that you can incorporate what you've learned today with the information that you got from strategic management. And we'll talk more about this when we look at the next stage.